Kelly. I'm a certified athletic trainer. I just finished my master's degree at Illinois State University and I did my undergrad and also had a bachelor's degree in athletic training from the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Next month or I guess in a week I'm moving to the University of Miami to start working my PhD. When they were planning this event they asked me to uh, come and talk about some of the research I did on correctos during my master's degree and so it kind of tied in nicely with everything that we have here and you know, it kind of came full circle about two years ago. I was throwing around ideas with Jay and Dr. Mark. I, you know, I just found him on LinkedIn and I was asking him what they thought about this idea because I actually had found correct toes on my own somehow. And then I read Jay's book and, you know, there was a sentence in there that you'll find that he says, I don't have any data to back up this product, but, you know, anecdotally he's found it that it helped really well. And I, you know, I'm sitting there trying to think of thesis ideas, and I'm like, what can I do? And I was like, all right, you know what? Uh, I'm going to do a study on this stuff. And the faculty at Illinois State were very interested in it. And I, Dr. Mark uh, introduced me to Dr. Ray, and Dr. Ray seemed like he was on board to do the study. And so it went from there. The study right now is titled The Influence of Plato Orthosis and Minimalist Shoe on Dynamic Balance and Hux Valgus Angle. And as you can see, it says in review. So to take what I'm telling you, with a grain of salt, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you that, you know, peer review uh, is still the gold standard, but this research is so new that it's, you know, sometimes it takes two or three years for a study to get published after you're done. And so you guys are kind of the first group of people to really hear this besides my thesis committee. And so I'm excited to share the results with you guys, I guess. So a little background for why we did this study. Uh, the NCAA uh, tracks injuries, and from 1998 to 2004, uh, they looked at some of the data of all the injuries that they uh, were tracking, and they found that over 50% of all injuries involved the lower extremity or occurred to the lower extremity. And additionally, on top of that, every single day in the United States, it's estimated that greater than 23,000 people suffer a lateral ankle sprain. Um, and it's actually the most commonly injured body part uh, in physically active people. Uh, and so, you know, as healthcare providers, you know, what do we do about this? mini epidemic of injuries if it's one of the most common things and and so previous research has looked at risk factors and trying to figure out you know why do people get injured and why do some people not get injured and we definitely don't know for sure 100 percent why some people do and some people don't and we still are learning more every day but we definitely have risk factors that have been identified you know some of them are being a female is a risk factor uh, biomechanical alignment uh, flexibility neuromuscular control uh, taping or bracing and then for this study poor balance has been identified as a risk factor uh, in multiple studies actually uh, it was also found that decreased balance in healthy subjects was a risk factor for an acute ankle injury and the same authors found that decreased balance in people that have already sustained an ankle injury or a lateral ankle sprain are at a significant risk for re-injury and so Doing this study was a little difficult because balance is still a concept, it's a theory, you know, really what is balance. And so some working definitions of balance out there are, you know, balance is defined by uh, the first two authors, Trop and Guskowitz and Perrin, as the ability, ability to maintain your center of mass over your base of support. And so, you know, that is very broad and general and doesn't really tell us a lot. And you know, just because you can do this does not correlate to what you can do dynamically with activity and most people don't sprain their ankles standing here doing nothing and so I wanted to look at dynamic balance something that was very functional and something that you know correlated a lot with human movement we don't just stand around all day and so for my study I define dynamic balance as uh, the ability to maintain stability or, uh, of your center of mass with movement and even that is still a foreign concept, so how do I measure that? Well, in the literature, uh, the STAR excursion balance test, I, SEBT, was developed by a guy named Gary Gray, and originally it had eight different directions. Uh, it had, you know, every 45 degrees you would reach. So you see a person standing on one leg, and with the opposite leg, they would reach, and you would measure how far they could reach while still 
uh, returning to the center. And it's a more a test of neuromuscular control because it requires strength, flexibility, and proprioception. But I guess that goes with every single balance test or measure of balance out there. However, the thing about this test is that it is a very reliable. Uh, studies have found it to be very, very reliable. So if I measure you now and measure you again later, is it reliable? Yes. Or if I measure you and Jay measures you, is it reliable that way? Both ways it's very reliable. So inner rater and intra rater reliability is very high for this. Additionally, uh, when it was first found uh, or, or developed, it had these eight directions. But other research has found that there was a performance redundancy. So you, know, you didn't need to test in all eight directions to get the most significant information. And so over time, the star exerted balance test became uh, primarily of three different directions, the anterior, the posterior medial, and posterior lateral. And those are all named in reference to the stance leg. So posterior medial would be me reaching across my body. That comes in later. Uh, on top of that, uh, the Y balance test kit is uh, an instrument version of the star excursion balance test. Um, the group of researchers who did a lot of star excursion balance test research did it to try and expedite or standardize the star excursion balance test. Uh, some might say that there's you know, a monetary gain to doing it as well, but if you can you know, put food on the table doing something you know a lot about, go ahead. Um, but it is a reliable and field expedient way for researchers and clinicians to both assess balance with movement or with, that kind of matches more with what we're looking at. And it was a much quicker way for me to look at dynamic balance when I didn't have you know, resources for lots of high tech other ways to measure balance. Uh, with the STAR excursion balance test, it actually has been found to be predictive or uh, sensitive to injury risk. And in some previous studies, they found like with high school basketball players, um, those who had an asymmetrical reach distance to the anterior direction of greater than four centimeters from left to right were at least 2.5 times more likely than those without to sustain a lower extremity injury. Uh, the same group, but split into girls, those who had a composite score of less than 94% of their limb length were six and a half times more likely to develop a lower extremity injury. And another study using the actual Y balance test, uh, college football players who scored less than 89.9% were three times, 3.5 times more likely to sustain an injury. And so that took their relative total risk of injury from about 37% up to 68%. And then for this last one, that kind of matches my study the most, uh, they found that increased performance on the star excursion balance test was protective of injury risk. And so those who performed better were less likely to sustain an injury than those who had worse scores in a population of young, healthy college students. Uh, previous in the literature, a lot of researchers have looked at various uh, interventions such as textured insoles, orthotics, textured surfaces to look at you know if they could influence balance. And it's definitely not a novel approach to try and influence balance through certain modalities like that. And there's been some mixed results, but generally, that you know, they have found that certain interventions can increase balance in people. However, there is a lot of different uh, measures of balance used in the research, and there's a lot of different interventions used. So there's not very uh, you can't compare between the studies very well because there's not a lot of standardization across different studies. So that brought me to this study. Uh, as many of you have seen today or may know from the past, correct toes is made from silicone. Uh, it goes between your first through fifth digits and it provides a buffer of spacing between each one. So that was uh, our main intervention that we wanted to look at. However, if we wanted to do a study on correct toes, we either needed to have everybody be barefoot all the time or have control shoe, one, because we need to be able to control for that variable, but two, most shoes these days that you would find on the average college student cannot fit correct toes at their you know, shoe size that they're probably already wearing. And we started this study just with the intent of having a controlled shoe, but uniquely we found that we ended up doing a study looking at minimalist shoes. And saying the word minimalist shoe is kind of a gray area 
because there's not a standardized definition of what a minimal shoe is yet. Previous research has looked at, um, or that has used minimalist shoes, has either used that the market, the company marketed their shoe as minimalist, or that they met some criteria. And some examples of criteria, like for Dr. Lieberman, he defines a minimalist shoe as something that lacks high cushion heels, uh, stiff soles, and doesn't have any arch support. And he also gives the criteria that you know, the thickness of the cushioning in the rear foot and uh, forefoot should be about equal. You should be able to twist the shoe upon the axis, and you should be able to bend it at the midfoot, and once again, you shouldn't have any arch support. And so there's not really um, you know, a cut point on what makes something a minimalist shoe or not. There's a continuum, and so if 100% or ultimate minimal is being barefoot, going down from there is where minimalist shoes start to deviate. So even as you look back in the past, there were shoes that were minimalist, or there are shoes that are minimalist that were never me meant to be minimalist or marketed. That just, you know, it's on a continuum. And Blaise Dubois, who Dr. Mark has mentioned, uh, has a website called The Running Clinic, and he tries to grade a lot of people off of these type of criteria. And for this shoe, he rated uh, our trial shoe as an 85%. So if 100% uh, is barefoot, they got a mid B range score. Um, and today, there hasn't been any studies that looked at a foot toe orthosis, such as correctos, or a minimalist shoe. And so we really want to look at these two different variables. Uh, our specific measures were the Y balance test, specifically the lower quarter Y balance test, and its composite reach score, and hallux valgus measurement. Uh, we hypothesized that dynamic balance would improve and that hallux valgus angle would actually decrease. So this was a controlled laboratory study with randomization. We were looking for young, healthy people between the age of 18 and 29, and uh, they had to be recreationally active with a moderate physical activity level at least three times a week. Um, that was based off of, uh, I'm forgetting, I'm drawing a blank right now, but one of the guidelines set forth by, I think, the National Academy of Sports Medicine. And to be included as well, there, we had to have a potential size match with our donated control shoes and the foot toe orthosis. We excluded people if they had a previous lower extremity injury in the past six months that we defined as uh, an injury that would alter their physical activity for greater than three days. That's a gray area as well when you do research because technically a blister is an injury. And so we wanted something that altered their ability to be physically active. We also didn't want any sort of conditions that could alter any neuromuscular or control or balance. And so certain things like concussions or inner ear issues or any neuropathic conditions or uh, inability to have per like peripheral neuropathy, for instance. So we, we tried to exclude, or we did exclude anybody who had that sort of history. And we also excluded any history at all of lower extremity surgery. So uh, people were mostly recruited via in-class announcements and flyers. We had 65 people sign up, and to start, we included 65 people. Um, nobody really met the exclusion criteria that I just talked about, but I did list the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So most people who signed up already knew what we were looking for, so we didn't really have an issue with that. We randomly allocated people to each group uh, after they volunteered and filled out our pre-participation questionnaires. And between the end and uh, between the beginning baseline testing and follow-up testing, we only lost two people in our study. They were in the foot toe orthosis group. I guess I should explain the three groups a little bit better to you guys. The FTO group is the correct toes and the minimal shoe, the LEM shoe group. The SO group is the shoe only group, so they only received the LEM shoe. And the control group came in for pre and post testing and didn't have a true intervention. And so we lost two people in the correct toes group. Ideally, you would like to have more balanced numbers, but I was doing a master's thesis and I had bigger plans for more people and I ran out of time to be able to graduate on time. So I kind of ran short of my goal population. Here's some of our characteristics or demographics of our different groups. If you look at the numbers, you can see it's a pretty homogenous group, at least with you know, height, weight, and age. Um, 
we tried to get as even as we could with the actual uh, grouping number size. Our instruments, basic goniometer, the live balance test kit, uh, cloth tape measure to measure leg length, correct toes, and the primal two made by lens for our control shoe. So I already talked about how we recruited people. We gave them a pre-participation questionnaire to make sure that they did fit, just in case they slipped through the cracks. We allocated them, and after group allocation, we took baseline measures. And so we did the Y-balance test and Alex Valgus uh, measure. After that, after testing, they were given uh, their intervention if they were getting one. So the first two groups, you know, they were sized for correct toes, and they were sized for their uh, shoe. And we used, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the insole uh, test, but you pull the insole out of the control shoe and give them the correct toes. And if their uh, foot splay was over the insole, we gave them a next size up. And for the actual shoe itself, too, for the group with just the shoes, we made sure that they were not impinging on their feet at all to make sure that their toe box space was adequate enough. Uh, they were given instructions not to change their physical activity levels, not to change, you know, exercise routines, not to start training for a marathon, and just do what they've been doing. And our study was four weeks in length, so four weeks later, they returned for their follow-up testing. Uh, for the actual testing, they were given a standardized instructional video before testing for the dynamic balance test. And then they practiced with six practice trials for each direction on each leg and this control for the learning effect associated with the testing protocol. Then we gave them a break and we measured their limb length uh, during the test period or the rest period before we actually collected their data. Um, this is our specific testing order. Uh, right anterior, left anterior, right posterior medial, left posterior medial. Standardized based off of the protocol from the literature and just to make sure that everybody got tested the same way too for us. Um, we recorded all three successful trials, but we only used the greatest reach distance in our data analysis. Uh, to have a successful reach, you had to meet these criteria of uh, maintaining a unilateral stance on the platform. You had to maintain your foot contact with the reach indicator. Um, I think I have another picture to show you guys. But when they are reaching, you measure how far they reach by a little platform on top of a PVC pipe that has increments in half centimeters to be able to tell how far they can reach. And so they can't put their foot on top of it and they can't kick it, you know, use momentum. And then they also have to return that foot, the reach foot, back to center without, or, yeah, without losing control. So they stay under control and have adequate balance. We didn't give any movement coaching and we didn't control for different movement patterns or behaviors of how they went about reaching as long as it was in control and they met these criteria. Uh, to measure Alex Valgus angle, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, didn't have a lot of access to high tech stuff for this one. So we palpated and marked out the first metatarsal and uh, marked out the bisection of the phalanges and measured the angle that these two reference points, or these few reference points made using the goniometer and that. This is the uh, formula used to figure out composite reach score. Part of it is not showing up though. Uh, this, I guess, got changed the format. It's supposed to be under here. So it's supposed to be greatest anterior the sum of the greatest anterior, posterior medial, and posterior lateral, so the three directions, mm -hmm. over limb length times three, multiplied by 100, to give you a percentage composite score. Here's our inner or intra rater reliability measures. Uh, you can see that they were all very reliable, so uh, that was collected during a pilot study to see how well our reliability was. The Y balance test reliability is for the composite score, not for each individual direction. Uh, statistical analyses. We first ran a statistical check for leg dominance to see if uh, left versus right made a difference for this measure and for these interventions, and we found that it didn't. So we pooled the data for left versus right and treated each subject's leg as one individual subject. 
and then we ran multiple uh, between group analyses of covariance and that was very beneficial because it controlled for baseline differences between the different groups which you'll guys see here in a second um, our independent variables were the different interventions and then our dependent variable was our outcome measures we also calculated effect sizes using a uh, Cohen's D with corresponding 95% uh, confidence intervals based off of the uh, the mean difference and standard deviation of the differences. Uh, we set an alpha level of point equals 05 a priori to determine our statistical significance, and we also had hour logs that we used to control for hours of wear because I guess I should take a step back and mention that we had the first week be a habituation uh, week for each group besides the control group. So uh, first week you started with wearing your correct toes or shoe a half an hour a day and you increase that a half an hour every day for the first week up to four hours. The remaining three weeks you had to wear the foot toe orthosis and control shoe a minimum of four hours a day but you were allowed to wear them for more than four hours a day if it wasn't causing you any issues and but they had to log their hours every single day in a log that we collected. Uh, yep. So there was no significant differences between any of the groups for uh, hours of wear. And that meant there was, you see the numbers right here, the means between the two groups, the correct toes group wore a mean of 4.03 hours per day, but the shoe only group only wore theirs there, for 3.81, but that wasn't uh, statistically significant difference. And so we didn't have to exclude anybody either because all subjects were within plus or minus 1.5 standard deviations of the group means. And so nobody wore, there was no outliers that were going to screw up our data. Um, after adjusting for the baseline scores like I, I talked about, we found that there were significant differences between the post-intervention scores on the dynamic uh, Y balance test. Uh, and that p-value was 0 0.001. And pairwise comparisons, which are looking at the individual groups or differences between the groups, found that every single group was different than it's each other group. So the correct toes and shoe group was different than the shoe group. The shoe group was different than the control group. And the foot toe orthosis and shoe group was different than the control group as well. Uh, our effect sizes, the correct toes and shoe group had an effect size of 0 0.0, which is a strong effect size. And the shoe only group effect size was 0.45, which is a moderate. There's weak, moderate, and strong effect sizes for people who might not be as inclined to statistics. And you like to use effect sizes for when you want to look in more closely at maybe clinical meaningful not meaningfulness. Man, I can't talk. Uh, and so just because something's statistically significant doesn't mean it, it's making a big difference. However, our ANCOVA found no differences uh, in any of the groups for Halx valgus angle between pre and post measures. So here's a graphic of our changes. And so the blue on each one is our pre-measures for each group. So we have the correct toes group, the shoe only group, and our control group. And then the red is obviously the post measures. And you can definitely see the differences without looking at the actual numbers very well between the pre and post measures. And these are all the, the, the differences left to right. Besides this, those are all significantly different. And this is just our data, uh, looking at the actual numbers instead. Um, pretty self-explanatory, but I think it's easier to see with the visual from before. So our study was to look at the influence of the correct toes and the control shoe on Alex Valley's angle and dynamic balance. And our results were the first to show that uh, using correct toes and a minimalist shoe may cause an increase in dynamic balance over four weeks of wear in a healthy young college population. Um, we did not find any changes to Helix Valgus with our data though. So uh, our results were similar to kind of the studies I talked about early that have used uh, textured insoles, orthotics, textured surfaces. However, it's a very novel modality of choice to try and intervene. And so direct comparisons like I talked about are very difficult. 
And so we don't have really any other research to compare our results to. However, um, those other studies have theories of why or what is causing uh, these changes in dynamic balance. And uh, one theory is that the orthosis or shoe could increase joint congruency or change biomechanical alignment by correcting any potential variations in anatomical alignment. Another theory that's talked about a lot in the literature is the ability for these orthoses or shoes to alter sensory afferent information that's received from the feet or from the lower extremities. And so theoretically, correct toes could influence the afferent, afferent feedback of both the mechanoreceptors in the individual joints of the foot and from the actual plantar cutaneous nerves that it's touching. Um, theoretically, the correct toes could also widen, I guess it's not even a theory, when you put correct toes on, it widens your base of support while you're wearing them for sure. But that was also one of the ideas. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. When you take the correct toes off to balance, though, it's not reliant upon that uh, piece of information. And so the shoe as well could have allowed uh, increased base of support by having a greater toe box than what most of these people had. And it could have also allowed uh, increased afferent information by having a minimally conditioned or minimally cushioned shoe. Um, so the only thing we do know for sure is that while wearing correct toes or while wearing the shoe, there was a potential for passive displaying or an increased base of support. But our study wasn't really meant to look at why, and it was more of an if. So we found significant improvements in dynamic balance between both groups after four weeks, uh, despite testing barefoot. And the testing results were not reliant upon constantly wearing correct toes and constantly wearing uh, the limbs. And Alex Valgus angle had no significant findings. However, the gold standard for measuring Halix valgus angle is radiographic imaging. And this wasn't really a possibility because of cost and time associated with this for this study. And uh, once again, controlling for some of these things may have given a better picture and may have helped us understand more of why, but it really wasn't the aim of our study. And so we weren't really testing the theoretical model, models. Some other limitations. Uh, testers and subjects were not blinded to group allocation, and this could have influenced testing performance. Uh, we attempted to counteract it by encouraging every single subject to provide their best performance possible while testing. And our subjects were of a young, uh, healthy, collegiate population. Uh, specifically, uh, most of the, the students had a kinesiology and recreation major, or at least one related to it. And so that really limits the generalizability of our results. Um, specifically, these people are you know, very healthy and active compared to the average college student and let alone the rest of the adult population. Um, that kind of limits our ability to look at or to generalize to the elderly who are really at a huge risk of falls. And you know, maybe they would benefit from something like this, but we just can't generalize that as of right now. Another limitation to our study was the length of trial. And uh, four weeks, as we kind of talked about earlier today, is not enough time to have true or 100% soft tissue adaptation changes. And so where you may have seen differences with a longer period of time. Additionally, we don't know what a longer period of time would do for the increases that we've seen with dynamic balance. Maybe there's a potential for habituation However, other studies have found that even after three months of like a textured insole, they still found the same increased dynamic balance uh, that they measured for. And so I kind of have a feeling that wouldn't be the case. Um, we didn't control for foot type, but this was based off of a, a systematic review of the STAR excursion balance test by Gribble and Plisky. They found that as of right now, there is inconclusive evidence to support the idea that you should control for different foot types, um, at least for the star surgeon balance test that is. One thing that I wish we would have done is measure for other variables such as foot width uh, to maybe get a better picture of soft tissue changes that might have been responsible for uh, our intervention's results. Um, 
And another thing that I probably should mention is that the foot toe orthosis only came in two different sizes for our study. And so because of the variability in foot structure and foot sizes of our subjects, sometimes we had a less than ideal fit. Fortunately, now there, you know, there's several more sizes and there are special things you can do to a pair of correct toes or to uh, modify them, but that makes it really hard to have a good research study if you modify every single uh, correct toes from its original to fit every single person perfectly. And so we went with what was most generalizable for everybody. Future research probably should be directed at taking a closer look uh, at the influence of correct toes and minimalist shoes on biomechanical alignment. Specifically, it should be probably done with you know, gold standards of measurements such as radiographic imaging to allow for better, more accurate results. We had very reliable Haux valgus measurements, but I don't know if they were sensitive to actual changes that could have happened. Um, and there's also a need for prospective research to investigate uh, the actual model, model of efficacy between or behind what's happening here. Maybe you would never know. And I don't think that we can actually measure sensory afferent, so you can't really say, oh, my product gives better input to the central nervous system than this product, at least now in time, you know, that really doesn't exist. So you can, it's all conjecture beyond measuring actual true soft tissue changes, maybe measuring intrinsic muscular uh, musculature or other variables like that. But uh, future research probably should look at injury rates like I talked about, the Y balance test is predictive of injury, and so you know you you might think that just because we increase their uh, <coughs> performance, maybe you know that could have an impact on impact on their injury rate. We also don't know, you know, could this change an athlete's economy? You know, specifically thinking about runners, you know, could that influence their economy while running? Or maybe their power output. Uh, other research might want to look at. You know, does this grow or change the intrinsic musculature of the feet? And maybe using other tests, such as the landing error scoring system, which is kind of a new little test or other ones like it, to measure movement patterns and seeing how it modifies how people move objectively. Uh, in conclusion, our results suggested that the use of this foot toe orthosis and a control shoe may increase dynamic balance in a healthy, young, adult, college-age population. Uh, moderate and strong, or sorry, the moderate to strong effect sizes are promising for how well these work. But it is imperative that future research should look at the effects or the influence of these products in different populations, such as the elderly, uh, injured people, and people with neuropathic uh, conditions like people with diabetes. Um, it should also be investigated you know, specifically on what the long-term effects of these products are, you know, beyond four weeks, and knowing maybe a little more of why these findings were, or what is happening behind the scenes. Uh, this information, like I said, could be really good for potential treatments or a prophylactic approach, uh, especially with the knowledge that we have that lower extremity injuries are related to balance issues and. Uh, a better need for conservative management of the feet. And so uh, yeah, those are our main conclusions. And then uh, these are just some pictures of some feet that I have. And I was thinking about this earlier, but uh, the definition of pathology is any deviation from a healthy, normal, or efficient condition. And so we we're talking about efficiency and normal and talking about uh, an infant's foot. And here you can see uh, this is Michael Phelps' foot, okay? Obviously, you know, he's a swimmer, so we're not talking about running. And this is a, or was an uncontacted population of indigenous people from Brazil. And you can see the differences in these feet versus these feet. This is LeBron James, this is Usain Bolt, and this is Shaq. And so, I know that as an athletic trainer, a lot of us deal with people who take off their shoes and you see feet like this and you don't do anything about it. You, you say, um, you know, those are ugly feet, you put your socks back on. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, we think that there's nothing to do about it and we think that, you know, just some people's feet get messed up like that. But my question or idea is, you know, 
is there something we can do about it? Or is that the most efficient? Is, is LeBron James really as good as he could be? Is Usain Bolt as fast as he could be? Or could they be even better? And is, should you consider that normal for them? Maybe you don't want to change that because they might get slower. I don't know. But I have a hard time believing that you can do the toe spring up the hill like Dr. Mark was talking about when your toe looks like that. And uh, just some little acknowledgments before we go into questions. All the products for my study were donated and both of the companies waived their right to uh, the presentation of the data. Yes, I'm here to present it today, but I had the right to present the data whether it was a negative outcome or no findings at all. And I also wanted to thank both of the companies. Only Correctos is here today, but uh, they were very helpful in helping me schedule around uh, what I needed and changing you know, at the whim of my committee, you know, if we wanted more people or less people, you know, they were very accommodating. And I also wanted to thank this conference for letting me present my research. Uh, how about questions? Uh, nice work, Adam. Um, quick question. Uh, why did you use the maximum value on the excursion test and not the average of three? That's a good question, and that's one that I've definitely heard a lot. Um, we wanted it to be more of a, a predictor or a, a measure of absolute ability. And so, yeah, you might reach uh, 35, is your, say 35 is your mean of three, of the three, but you could actually reach 40, you know, was one of your scores. Your absolute balance ability and output is probably closer to the 40 and not the 35. And so they wanted to have the most clear picture of the, the person's ability. Well, if you ever have any questions that you want to ask me, here's my email, website, and Twitter handle. And uh, thank you guys. Mm -hmm.